Good evening, good evening. Blessings to you. We know it's now sending out the notification to the people on the channel. 127 people letting them know that we are live on the Victory in Christ broadcasting channel. Live broadcasting is what we do. That's what we're set up to do and what we love to do. And, and look forward to those who will be joining us in about a minute, a little under a minute now. Glad to have you with us. Uh, for those who are watching this back, of course, uh, I don't like the dead air and, and I'm excited about the fact and I'll make an announcement more officially at the end of this session. Uh, we, we Prayers have been answered uh, and I thank those who have been praying. So stick around to see what God has done. Uh, that being said, we're, we're coming right upon 9 Central Standard Time again. Glad to have you with us. Welcome to... Sunday School in Review, our Thursday evening program, 9 Central Standard. As we just said, I am your host, Gabriel Matthews. I'm glad to have uh, uh, you with us. And for those who will be joining us, uh, I look forward to having you join us soon. Uh, 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 this is a review of each week's Sunday lesson, and we do it ahead of time, really to give you a few days, uh, a few more days, a couple of more days to study it out this evening, of course. Uh, good evening, good evening. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, uh, glad to have you with us. So this gives you tonight, Friday, and then Saturday uh, uh, to be able to kind of uh, get some more study in. Hopefully you've been doing at least some preliminary study already. So this will be just in addition to the study you've been doing. We're going to look at Luke chapter 14. For those who may not have a Sunday school book, Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> and the target scripture is just for those who may not attend a Sunday school or a, a traditional so let me just say it that way. Traditional Sunday school, they give the lesson. It's a curriculum book that usually, and they tell you, you know, what the lesson's about. They give you title and all those things. Well, we don't get into the title because that's a, that's a subjective thing. Uh, we do take the the passage. We take the scriptures, the lesson scriptures, and so that's Luke chapter fourteen, seven through fourteen. And just for the sake of record, on some occasions, such as in Psalms, a, 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 a particular psalm. They may give a portion of the psalm. If it's not too long, I'd like to go ahead and, and look at the entirety of it. I really wish we could do the entirety. We're actually going to make some notes from all, almost the whole in chapter, whole entire chapter 14, but we won't read it. Let's just read our target scripture, starting at verse 7 out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It says this, He told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't recline at the best place because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both you, both of you, excuse me, may come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and recline in the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all of those guests, all of the other guests. Excuse me. Verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble or humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. May God have had a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most precious word. So this is for lesson, this is for the uh, Sunday, of course, coming March 3rd, 2019. 
Again, I, I don't get into titles and things because those are all subjective and start defining the words there because that's based on whoever put the particular lessons together. So let's move forward as we is our custom. The Bible genre or the genre of biblical literature in this case uh, for the gospel according to Luke falls under the literary category of the gospels. Okay, a word translated from the Greek term euanglion, euanglion. Uh, and means good news, plain and simple, means good news. This genre of biblical literature is specific to the Bible and was considered to be a new type of writing unlike any others when the gospel books were penned in the first century. Unique to these books, which include Matthew, Mark, and John, as most of us know, uh, is the fact that each of them contains some elements of the other types of writings, such as an example, which we have in our lesson tonight, is that of parables, which is in and of itself a type of genre in biblical literature. They are the sayings, in this case, of Jesus, told in short story or illustration form that are narrative and instructional, that are narrative and instructional, again, as we've already seen in our lesson. Luke's gospel account is unique to the others in that he gives a more precise chronology of the earthly sojourn of Christ, starting pre-conception and including an account of his childhood at 12 years old. He's the only one who deals with any particulars about his childhood. Note, his audience was that of one named Theophilus. It is believed he was a Roman citizen. Now I say it is believed, which means don't quote me. It is believed that he is a Roman citizen. There's not much known about him, which is why I said it is believed. That he is a Roman citizen, not likely of Jewish ancestry, but likely of great importance in light of the fact that a scribe like Luke is writing to him. So he's probably somebody, it's, it's more than likely he's someone of great importance who sought to know and understand the things of God as revealed by the person Jesus Christ. So he's writing the gospel of Jesus Christ to this more than likely important Roman citizen, potentially some, some sources say a, a Greek, uh, but again, we don't know for sure, uh, by the name of Theophilus. Note further, its attention to detail would potentially make it a more favorable read, uh, not only to Theophilus, but other non-Jewish Christians like ourselves. For example, being that we were not Jews, we would not have been privy to the things surrounding his birth. And so not just the, you know, the miraculous birth of being born to a virgin, but even some of the things in his childhood. Without loose gospel, we don't know what type of child he is. We have to assume he was an exceptional child because he was an exceptional man. But Luke removes any kind of having to guess, right? Luke tells us uh, 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 that he was indeed exceptional. And that's Luke, I believe, chapter two, at the end of chapter two. Uh, moving on. So the elements of the story. Now, when we were looking in the book of Psalm, we didn't have too much of this, but we, of course, now we do. Uh, we have the five elements. Most of you may already be familiar having caught some of our programs, characters, or <laughs> of course, remember school, characters, setting, plot, conflict, and then we go back and forth, on, uh, uh, re depending on the text, resolution or theme. And today, we're going to look at the resolution as I can, can understand it and ascertain it. Our characters, essentially, of course, the major character is Jesus himself. Uh, uh, the minor uh, uh, characters, if you will, uh, in, in this particular uh, uh, gospel account or in this chapter, if you will, uh, uh, is the leading Pharisee who invited Jesus in the first place, the host. And you have to have read verses one through uh, six, by the way, to get this information. But the leading Pharisee who invited Jesus, uh, a, a sick man who was set before Jesus, he's in the audience, apparently. Uh, uh, again, you have to read verses one through, uh, uh, one through six to get this information. A sick man, uh, the law experts and the Pharisees, these were all the individuals who were in this setting who were at this uh, Sabbath day setting, by the way. Uh, I know it might seem a little confusing because Jesus says and invites someone to a wedding. Well, this was a Sabbath day, okay? Uh, this was a Sabbath day. And by the way, 
Well, I'll, I'll deal with it later. I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, getting all excited about this thing. So the setting is the house, of course, of the leading Pharisee who had invited Jesus in the first place. So that's the setting. Uh, 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 likely residing somewhere in the Roman-occupied area of Palestine, also known as Judea. Let me do that again. So the setting where this, these characters are together is, of course, the house of this particular leading Pharisee. doesn't give his name, so we won't assume his name. Uh, 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 um, is, you said there's something wrong with the sound? I'm not sure. Here. My apologies, hopefully. I'm sure my media is up, but... Uh, I don't know if that's better. You may want to uh, go out and come back in. I don't. I don't think anything has changed. I really can't afford to open it anywhere else. So hopefully, if someone else is there, give me a thumbs up or something. Let me know if the sound is there. But you may want to uh, log out and log back in. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, if you can't hear me, yeah, of course. Ah, good. There we go. Good. So, so that's the setting, and somewhere in Palestine, also known as Judea, okay? Uh, uh, plot. Christ has been invited to a banquet, uh, has been invited to a banquet at one of the leading Pharisees' home, where many of them, Pharisees, uh, are gathered together on a particular Sabbath day. Again, verses 1 through 6 gives us that information. The conflict, ah, in consecutive chapters, Luke chapters 13 and now chapter 14, Luke records the activities of Christ on Sabbath days. It doesn't say what particular Sabbath, but on it just says on a Sabbath day. So on, on Sabbath days, he gives us the accounting of what Christ has been doing in chapters 13 and 14, in which the manner is of healing viewed as manual labor. So he's showing healing taking place in chapter 13 and chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, and the healing is being viewed as manual labor. And, and if you know anything, at least even precursory information about Sabbath, manual labor is forbidden, right? So, he, so, so Luke gives Theophilus and, of course, us, since we get to read it, uh, uh, the fact that, that Jesus has done something that is considered to, by them to be unlawful, by the Pharisees to be unlawful on the Sabbath day, uh, considered because it's considered to be manual labor. Uh, it is at the heart of contention between him in particular and the Pharisees. So it's very important to understand that there's a conflict going on. So I keep referring to verses 1 through 6, even though it's not selected, the selected passage, because there is a conflict that has taken place uh, uh, probably a couple of Sabbath, Sabbath days a couple of Saturdays, and I hate to say Saturday because it technically starts Friday at sundown and ends on Saturday at sundown, but there is a conflict that is constantly going on between Christ and the Pharisees, and he keeps doing these types of healings, miracle signs, and wonders, and of course, he's doing these things understanding that the Pharisees are seeing this as manual labor, and therefore they're seeing it as he's in position of disrespecting the law. In both cases, the question or conflict surrounds the lawfulness of healing a sick person. Everybody catch that? The, so, so the conflict surrounds the lawfulness of healing a sick person. No, this person is visibly sick. It's obvious to everyone. It's obvious to everyone. This person is, is visibly sick and he heals them using a physical action, not just speaking as he was fully capable of doing. I think that's a major point there. He's, he's, he can send his word. He can see a person and say to them, without even physically moving any other part of his body, be healed. But he intentionally, in chapter 13 and chapter 14, intentionally moved, reached out to touch them. He intentionally engaged them physically, which is why the conflict. Okay, So, so he is fully capable of just simply speaking, uh, 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 but... He chooses to move and to engage them. As a matter of fact, there are times when he literally sent his word and, and healed the centurion's, uh, centurion soldier's uh, servant. So here's what I think is the resolution. 
what Christ clearly does is by both his words and actions is to expose the ungodly attitude and character. Watch this. So while, what Christ clearly does is by his words and actions is to expose the ungodly attitudes and characters. Very important for our lesson character, which was on display by many of his audience members as revealed by their indifference for human life, despite the overtly poor condition of that life. So in both cases of chapter 13 and chapter 14, so this is why you got to catch the review because we give you some good depth. We give you some good meat here. So in chapters 13 and 14, we see this indifference to people who are clearly sick, people who have been sick in most cases for years, maybe even from their birth, right? And so here, these, the religious leaders, the, the, this, this group called the Pharisees, we'll talk about in a minute, are indifferent. They are seemingly oblivious to the fact that these individuals, in the case of chapter 14, this person is swollen, uh, uh, full of fluids, as it reads, and, and Christ heals them. So, so, so understand the Pharisees don't say anything about this man as it is apparent until he's healed and he's healed in the manner that Christ heals him, which shows that they have a character flaw, clearly a attitudinal problem. And so Christ resolves to expose that issue. And we're going to see why it's important. This indifference and apathy, apathetic reaction to the sick, lame, and demon-possessed is further indication of a mentality that uh, lacks humility and un, unbenevolent uh, behavior. And we're going to see this going forward. So here's some historical information. Uh, there is no particular historical information that would explain our study, uh, uh, that would uh, uh, explain it or expand it for the selected passage that they chose of Luke chapter 14, 7 through 14. I didn't see any particular in my research historical information that we can look at. However, however, Consider researching, for those of you like myself who would really like to get into some deep study, consider researching sometime between now and Sunday the Pharisee religion, uh, uh, religion or political faction, because the Pharisees were a not only a religious uh, a group or faction or sect, but they were really a political group as well, as you will see as you do more reading in the scriptures and study uh, uh, of that time, as well as study the Sabbath practices in that day, because remember, they're considering Christ to be in violation of the Sabbath day laws. So you have to do a little bit of study, a little bit, of, and I'm saying a little bit, but do some research on the Sabbath practices uh, uh, in that day, in Christ's day, uh, uh, which will give you a deeper and broader view of the interactions between Christ, his followers, and the prevailing leading religious political groups of that day, not just Pharisees, but there are also Sadducees, there are Essenes, uh, there are other groups that are around in that time, though the Pharisees seems to be the one often mentioned. So obviously they dominate. Now note, when researching the Sabbath, keep this in mind, that it, it, that it excuse me, keep this in mind that it has both religious and political aspects to it. That's why I said the Pharisees are a group that is not just religious in nature, Judaism, Judy, uh, you know, right? But they are also very political. So remember, when you start talking lawful or unlawful, you're talking politics. You're talking politics. When you start talking law and you're talking about lawfulness or unlawfulness, you're talking politics. So, so not just religious, you're also bringing in a political element as well. Okay, but it's not only just religious and political aspects. Its origins, however, are spiritual in nature. So if you go all the way back to, of course, Genesis chapter 2, you will realize that it has a spiritual origin, which is on the seventh day, God rested from, as it were, from his labor. So when, uh, when you take anything that starts with, and this is just a little special note I wanted to give you, when you take anything that starts out spiritual, uh, 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 such as uh, uh, coming directly from God, such that comes directly from God, and give it a human formula formulation uh, such that makes it religious, it can easily become political, uh, uh, i.e. corrupted. 
Okay, so so understand when you start with something spiritual, and and the moment you begin to put human formulation on it, even from an intent to do good, it often will become very religious, and this is where you get legalism. That's why I said it has a political element to it, and then of course once you get the political element to it, then you have the chance of corruption. Matter of fact, let's look at Romans chapter three. I want to just read this for you as an example of what I'm saying so I don't sound like I'm way off in space. Romans chapter 3. Excuse me, Romans chapter 8. Sorry about that. Chapter 8, verse 3. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, the very first part says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So, so that, that shows you something. The law is a good thing. As Paul goes on to, to make very clear, the law is actually a good thing. But by virtue of humanity, uh, we, we turn it into something that is often religious uh, or and political in nature, and eventually uh, uh, it becomes a dangerous thing. Uh, theological perspectives, let's move forward, we're making fairly good time. Uh, theological perspectives, uh, 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 and again, for those who may be new to the Sunday School Review, if you're saying, what is theological perspective? This is what I've gathered from studying the scriptures. I believe that the, the Godhead, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is communicating about themselves, how they, or even their their viewpoint and how they see the circumstances and situations, or just simply something that they are communicating that they're telling us. So they could be telling us something about them. So from, from their perspective, they're communicating something about them. It could be that they're uh, communicating a concept, an idea that helps us to understand their intention, or it very well may be just they want to uh, show us something about us from their perspective. Any kind of way to see that, ultimately, here's the key. The theological perspective means it's from them to us. They say, well, that's the whole Bible. To some extent, yes, in a general sense, but there are passages where it speaks of man's view of God. Psalm, for example, where the people are praising God, even though it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. David praised God. Moses wrote Psalm. Solomon wrote Psalms. As we know, the sons of Korah wrote Psalm, And they are, from their perspective, res responding to, reacting to, uh, 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 louding God. So that's from a human perspective about God, subjective as it may be. But then there is a theological perspective, a theological point of view. It's God's view of things. Christ, in this case, I believe, Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. Here's the point that God wants to make clear. Christ, or the Godhead wants to make clear, Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. He always was and will always be. Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, over in Luke chapter 6, in the same, same book we're looking at, but chapter 6, uh, I want you to hear what it says there. It says these words, and I'm actually reading out of the New King James Version. It says, Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields, and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful, here it is again, uh, to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answering them said, have you not heard or have you not in this case read this, what David did when he was hungry, uh, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Let's keep going. Now it happened on another Sabbath. 
Notice how this, this legal day, this, this day that is set in the laws. Remember, Exodus chapter 20 talks about the Sabbath and keep it holy. So it is a law of God, in fact. Now, it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. Now another healing situation. Watch this. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath. Wow. Which would be work in their mind. Heal on the Sabbath. That they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who, was, who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, "Will I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good, wow, or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand, do some work, stretch out your hand, and he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. What they might do to Jesus. I know we love Jesus, but understand that's not always the case of some. They, 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 don't, they, they did not always love him. So, so while we may love him, there are people in this day and time who do not, uh, who do not love him. That said, the matter in question, why does this keep coming up, uh, uh, Brother Matthews? I'm glad you're asking. The matter in question, watch this, uh, uh, surrounding the issue of lawful or unlawful in any case speaks directly to whether or not you see Christ as divine and therefore equal to God the Father, noted as the giver of those very laws. Let me do that one again. So the matter in question that we see in Luke chapter 6, the matter that we've seen, of course, in Luke 14, I've mentioned already is in Luke 13, that keeps coming up and Luke keeps bringing attention to, the real issue is not lawful or unlawful, but it, it, it's, does Christ, is Christ divine? Right. And if he's divine, is he therefore divine to the extent that he's equal to God, the father noted as uh, and who is also understood to be the giver of the very laws. Uh, if the hypostatic union, stay with me, the hypostatic union is biblical and therefore factual. If the hypostatic union is biblical and therefore uh, factual, which identifies Christ as the God man, uh, such as to say 100% God, 100% man, then he is both the originator of the law and righteous judge, or he is the righteous evaluator of all mankind in light of it. Let me do that one again. If he is indeed the God man, if he is indeed 100% God, 100% man, as we who are believers and have studied our scripture believe him to be, hopefully you're in that camp, believe him to be, then he is both the originator of the law of the law and the righteous judge or evaluator of all mankind in light of it. He is the one who actually is to determine if it's lawful or unlawful to do what is to be done or not done on the Sabbath. He is because he is the originator. He alone determines who has, is, and will rise to eternal glory or will fall to eternal punishment. He alone is the one to determine this. As a matter of fact, go with me quickly to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, again out of the New King James Version, in large part because I don't want to uh, uh, turn away from my main uh, uh, passage. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. I charge you therefore before God, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Okay? Preach the word. Be ready. Why? Because of the one who will have to stand before God and the and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll actually come back to this when we look at later on at Matthew 
chapter 25. So it's extremely important then to understand that, to me, the theological point from these passages, and I know that's not the overall point in your Sunday school, but I think it's a major point to, to set in your mind, is that when Jesus is constantly being confronted, is he's being confronted on the basis of does he have the authority to do the things he's doing even when the leading uh, 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 religious political groups, Jewish groups of the day are saying, no, that's unlawful. They are questioning his authority, his right to do what he is doing. So let's go quickly on to the summary and we'll be out of your way. Uh, let's go on to our verses. We pick up the event, as we know, in chapter 7, uh, the event of the, uh, of the Sabbath meal at the leading Pharisee's home at Christ telling, the, uh, telling of a parable to the other guests, having taken note, watch this, of how they were selecting where they would seat themselves. So that's verses 7 through 11. So when we pick up our lesson for Sunday, we're picking it up in the midst of all this going on, he's already healed the man who was essentially bloated or fooled with fluids. He's healed, and this is the Sabbath, and he questions them. In the previous chapter, they question him. In this chapter, he questions them. And now, as he goes forward into the chapter, having exposed that they have an indifference and they have an apathetic a disposition towards a man who is clearly in need of healing uh, and, and constantly, is it lawful? Is it lawful? Again, here's the question back and forth, is it lawful? He goes forward and I believe further exposes their indifference and apathetic uh, uh, disposition to those who are in need. Watch this. So what is clear is that the social gatherings were apparently set up uh, in a way that made obvious the social economic standing identifying dignitaries such as big wigs, celebrities, VIPs in contrast, watch this, to lesser important party guests. So the way they did it in that time in their parties were they set up places that were clearly considered to be better. Now I, I, you have to do some research, I apologize I was not able to dig in and find out how they set up their particular, what was the physical uh, setup and why they did it that way. But clearly, in these settings, they set up their, their parties, their, their dinner or their, their meal uh, uh, um, events. There you go. They set up their meal events, whether it be breakfast, lunch, or dinner. They set them up in such a way where the important people, the big wigs, the celebrities, the VIPs, would be given the better seats. So that you got to understand, this is how they did it. So, so literally, where one was placed in the gathering indicated how they were seen uh, on the class system of that day. So basically, if I, if President uh, uh, Trump is what it is comes in, he is the highest dignitary. He is the the, the VIP. He gets the best seat. So if you set up your setting in the modern times in a way that apparently they did, he would get the best seat because he is, of course, the highest individual by virtue of class, uh, a social class system, political disposition, whatever you want to say, in the United States of America. So if he's an invited guest and he actually shows up to your home, in regards to how you feel about him, you would be considered out of order not to give him your choice seat, your best seat, your favorite seat. If it's the, if it's the, the part that has the best view of the TV, I don't know, then that's the one you give him. At the head of the table is normally kind of how we would look at it. So that's, cu that's customary. Literally, that's how you knew who was the most important person in the event, in the circumstance. No. Such uh, uh, differentiation still exists to this day. It still exists to this day. Maybe not at just kind of a common house party. Everybody's just there mingling. But there are still situations where the, the, the top person, I went to a celebration for a pastor and his wife as they're preparing for their anniversary service. So it's a pre, it was a pre-banquet celebration. And indeed, and in fact, they were set at the choice table, at the head table, and they had their family, uh, children, grandchildren, etc., sitting with them at the table. And the person who gave an address at the banquet was sitting alongside them as the invited guests. And so they were at the choice table. Okay? So, so we still do this to this day. 
uh, uh, verse 11 then, since we, 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 we were looking at 7 through 11, verse 11, however, precisely states the point of the preceding parable, why he spoke it in the first place. Here it is, again, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself or humbles himself will be exalted. Attitude, 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 as we already have been saying, attitude, attitude, attitude is more often than not reflected in and by action. Let me let that sink. Slow it down a little bit. I'm ahead of time. Attitude, attitude, attitude is more often than not reflected in and by action. There are few, if any at all, who can ultimately hide their truest attitude. There are few, if any at all, who can actually hide their attitude because their actions will indeed speak. And of course, as we love to say, louder than words. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, just to show you this, Philippians chapter 2, it's a very familiar passage, but since we're making a point about attitude, watch this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Wow, there it is. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Now, now just for the sake of it, watch the actions re relative to his attitude. Who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. See his attitude and therefore his actions. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave can have a high minded attitude and then assume the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself. There it is. Humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Wow. So Christ, according to Paul, was the great example of his own teaching in here. He then turns his attention to the one who invited him in the first place. He turned his attention. You know, Christ is an equal opportunity, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, teacher. He's an equal opportunity teacher. So, so, so here, here's what I gather uh, from the text. And this might be something that uh, uh, you may disagree with or you may find fascinating in terms of your own study. Guest lists are intentional and indicative or telling or revelatory. Did you catch it? Of the attitudinal disposition of the inviter. Guest lists often reflect, let me just simplify. Guest lists often reflect what disposition or what uh, attitude the, 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 the person who was inviting has. And of course, you can see this in, uh, uh, for example, in chapter, uh, the same chapter, Luke chapter 14, 15 through 24, where he talks of a, of a, of a, a person who has prepared and then sends his slave out to invite guests. I'll let you read that at your leisure. That's chapter 14 of Luke. 15 through 24. The fact that the hope that his host invited so many glory seeking people reflected his own proclivity for seeking societal glorification. The fact that, the, in other words, the person that invited him invited not only him, a person who obviously was, uh, was at the very least infamous, probably by this point, he also invited tons of other Pharisees and, and, and people who were glory seekers, who, who had a, a, a proclivity for societal glorification. They wanted to be glorified by the surrounding society. This is a clear indication of the lack of humility, even on the part of the one who extended the invitation. Wow. So that person is not exempted. Christ's admonished, admonishment is consistent with the overall message of the Godhead and, in fact, will be the measure uh, by which one is judged as righteous before God. It's powerful. Please, let me, let me do it again. Christ's admonishment here to the one who was the inviter, the one who, who opened up his home. 
His admonishment is so serious, it is actually consistent with the teaching, and it is actually the measure, believe it or not, of for the judgment that will happen at the end. Don't believe me? Let's go to Matthew, as I already alluded to, we were going to go, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Watch this, watch this. And this is actually consistent with the lesson and hopefully makes the lesson abundantly clear. Starting at verse 31. Here's what it says. 31. It says this, when the Son of Man, we know to be Jesus Christ, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit, excuse me, on the throne of his glory. Excuse me. All the nations will be gathered before him, will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from one another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Ironically, the high seat and the low seat. Interesting. Then the king will say to those on his right, watch this, come you who are blessed by the father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Stop right there. What point did we make earlier? We made the point earlier that he is the judge. He is the judge. He is the judge of who, who was, who is, was, and will be considered lawful or unlawful, even though they were trying to judge him. He is actually the final evaluator. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared of, cared of me. You took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. I hope you see that. That's, that's not indifference and apathy. That's not indifference and apathy. You can't do those things and be indifferent. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, here it is, answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's all. Matter of fact, we're done. Uh, a great lesson, power pack lesson. Hope you, en you enjoy it for those who are able to uh, uh, get to your uh, local Sunday school. Uh, uh, and, and again, this is just a review. Uh, I'm able to deal with a bit more information that, than is often presented on a Sunday. I started teaching Sunday school back at the age of 19, which puts me at 26 years of ministry as of the day after my birthday, which was yesterday. So I, my, my, my birth, my ministry date, start date was the day after my birthday, 26 years ago. So glad to uh, have been able to, to be at this, this long. So I hope you enjoy your Sunday school. If you've enjoyed this review, as you heard me, hear me say just about every single time we, I do a broadcast of some sort, please share it out on your page. That's how we can not only build our audience, which of course, you know, we're, we're, we're a broadcast channel. We want to build our audience, but we want to bless people with God's word. Uh, 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 any gift that you could possibly give, the eternal gift, uh, his, his truth endured to all generation, the, the, the car, the car, the, the diamond ring, all that stuff is as precious as it is, cannot be compared to the gift of God's word. So please share these, 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 if you believe that they're beneficial and blessing you, please share them out on your personal page, hit that share button, and then it'll give you a copy link button. And you just go on to your page, right in that section that says, uh, 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 what are you thinking? Or, you know, you have something on your mind. And when you hit it, you may have to right click it if you're using a mouse or press down. It'll give you a paste. Hit the paste and it'll give you the link. Once it gets the link, hit the share. And voila, we are now on your your personal page, and that will give people opportunity. Of course, send invitations to your friends and family on your page to invite them to the channel, and we will receive them gladly uh, to come and join us on the channel and, and enjoy the programs as you are doing. I said I had a special announcement, and I will make it and get out of the way here, uh, again, getting us out of here a little early, and that is uh, we are on the verge of getting that laptop 
it will be here uh, uh, more than likely by Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. So we will uh, hopefully have it up and ready to go uh, uh, probably mm, maybe Thursday if we're pushing. Uh, I know me, I'll, I'll be pushing for Thursday. <laughs> uh, 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 but we got some things that we have to do uh, uh, in terms of business and, and home business and things of that nature. But we'll be pushing to get it up and running. At the very least, come next Tuesday for our program, uh, we will have it up and ready to go. So, God be praised. I thank you all who have been praying. Uh, uh, God made provision for the ones whom God used, for the one whom God used to make provision. Thank you so much. You know who you are. Uh, uh, I don't have permission to, to say the, who they are, but I thank you. Uh, your 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 help has is, is been pivotal. That laptop, I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, is going to take these broadcasts quickly to another level. We'll have music and, and all those things. I'm going to have to play around with it, of course, to, 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 to move in and out. But uh, we're going to have some music. We'll have a, a fixed background, so you won't have to be looking at my wall <laughs> and behind me. And so it's it's a wonderful thing. And we, we just know God has made a provision, made a way. And for the one who blessed us with that provision, we pray blessings upon you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am full time in the ministry, uh, uh, not here to beg, here to just simply make the announcement. If God moves upon you to be a benefit, uh, the information is, is posted and tagged at the top of the channel. So when you click into the channel, you will see uh, uh, the post. It's the only typed post basically on, on the channel. So by all means, please, uh, 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 if, if God moves on you to, to do any kind of contribution, it'll tell you how to go about doing it. If you want to give directly to me, it'll tell you how to do it through through an app. Most of us have phones who that have plenty of apps on to tell you how to do it. If you want to give and get a tax uh, 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 deduction, uh, also you can do that through Christ Association. It tells you how to do that as well. So that being said, have a great night. Hey, you're getting out 15 minutes early. Uh, I love that as well. Uh, uh, be blessed. Until next time.